think of some of your favorite mean characters from TV, movies, and various fiction. Why do you enjoy watching them? Doesn't it seem nonsensical to like a character so ugly on the inside? Their whole persona is to be a jerk, rude, a nuisance, or even put our heroes in danger. So why do we not hate them? Today I want to explore how the creators and writers behind some of the best mean, nasty, and evil characters somehow still make them beloved by fans. This is How to Write Mean Characters. As I'll be listing names of characters here, you'll notice that the trick to making a mean character likable is to give them a personality or physical trait that balances the meanness, which in turn makes them more human and makes them easier for us, the audience, to like. If any of these characters were written as mean or evil and that was all there was to them, sure, they'd be just repulsive and unlikable. They wouldn't be as relatable or as easy to enjoy for viewers. Let's take the simplest of the mean character archetype, a character whose entire existence at their core is to be rotten towards their counterparts. The two that come to mind first are Ren Hoek from The Ren and Stimpy Show and Mo Howard from The Three Stooges. Both Ren and Mo are created and molded from the same hateful clay. They're cruel, callous, physically abusive assholes to their counterparts. Stimpy with Ren, Larry and Curly with Mo. Ren is constantly smacking or punching his simple, kind-hearted best friend, Stimson J. Cat. Ren usually just wants to be left alone, but Stimpy's antics always cause annoyance and trouble for him. You filthy swine! I will kill you! Mo is practically stuck with his pals Larry and Curly, or Shemp, and they screw up so much that the entire comedy of the series is Mo punishing them by face slapping, eye poking, belly punching, and using various objects and tools to harm them. Larry and Curly frustrate Mo to no end, so this is how he retaliates. But with both Mo and Ren, notice how once they're up against pretty much anyone else, they cower. They're pathetic little worms. As soon as a cop or authority figure shows up, Mo is suddenly not so tough. He cowers and shrivels up and lets the authority figure push him around with ease. With Ren, he's a small, shivering little chihuahua. Anytime a human being or other character is around, they're usually huge and towering compared to Ren, and more times than not, he'll end up taking even greater pain and injury from them, which in turn counterbalances and makes up for all the abuse he usually gives to Stimpy. Why don't you ask me for a little discipline? May I have a little discipline? Another good addition to Ren's character is that, along with a grumpy character like Bert from Sesame Street, Ren has moments peppered throughout the show where you can tell that deep down he really does care for Stimpy, or Bert with Ernie. Even though Stimpy is constantly annoying Ren with his stupidity and goofiness, there are plenty of examples throughout the show that if Stimpy left and was gone, Ren instantly misses him and turns to a puddle of tears. Who needs ya? And upon Stimpy's return, Ren has happiness and life breathed back into him. He really does need Stimpy, and this is what helps balance his character out from his usual meanness and cruelty. How about Ralph Cramden from the classic sitcom The Honeymooners? Ralph is a loud, grumpy, oafish lummox of a man who's always yelling at his wife Alice, his neighbor and best pal Ed Norton, and pretty much anyone that crosses his path. You are a blabbermouth! A famous recurring bit from the show, Ralph will many times even physically threaten Alice. You're going to the moon! <laughs> but what makes the bit funny is that if you watch the show, you'll know that Alice is a fiery lady who's always easily standing up for herself against her oaf of a husband. And no matter what Ralph says to her, she'll always have a quip or insult that puts him in his place. For anyone these days who thinks The Honeymooners is problematic due to all of Ralph's empty threats of violence, you gotta take a step back and not just examine eight seconds of one of these scenes. If you watch the show and know these characters, you'd know that Alice is very clearly the one in control, and she's always proving that Ralph is much more bark than he is bite. The joke isn't the idea of Ralph punching his wife in the face, it's that he's so clearly not in control of the situation that his threat is ridiculous. There's no way he'd successfully win against Alice even if he tried to do anything. It's another example of a character being loud, cruel, and brash, but at the end of the day, Ralph's a harmless, pathetic little worm compared to his stronger and much smarter wife. I learned something tonight, too. Yeah, what? Well, I learned that I don't even mind growing old as long as you and I grow old together. Huh. Baby, you're the great.
Oh, the Grinch. This guy is a reclusive shut-in who lives above the carefree town of Whoville, where all the happy Who's live. The holidays are their favorite time of year, yet the Grinch hates the Who's happiness so much that he wants to steal Christmas from them. How could we possibly enjoy watching a creep like this? Well, while he's a complete stick in the mud, you can tell right from the beginning that the Grinch is a very lonely soul. He lives alone up Mount Crumpet in a spooky cave, blocking himself off from any friends, neighbors, or contact. The addition of a pet dog named Max is brilliant on Dr. Seuss's part, as it illustrates that even the Grinch has a little corner of his small black heart reserved for caring for an animal. Max gives the Grinch someone to talk to, confide in, and even bounce off of for comedy relief. If there was no Max the dog, I think the Grinch would be too lonely and pathetic, and it wouldn't be as fun or easy to like him. And of course, by the end of the story, the Grinch has a full character arc and ends up joining the Who's in the holiday celebration. Of course, once he learns, he couldn't crush their spirit despite stealing all their Christmas toys and decorations. Through this whole story, we almost pity the Grinch, and we want to see him change and be happy. So when he does finally turn over a new leaf, it's satisfying for us. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. South Park creators Matt Stone and Trey Parker have stated numerous times over the years that the biggest inspiration for Eric Cartman is the cantankerous Archie Bunker from the classic sitcom All in the Family. Makes total sense, both Cartman and Archie are horrible, bigoted, racist jerks. But the balance that makes them not only beloved by fans, but the best characters in each of their shows? Both Cartman and Archie's schemes and motives constantly blow up in their face, and they're rarely, if ever, rewarded by the end of the episode. On top of that, everything blowing up in their face is usually due to their own stubbornness or stupidity, making them end up in even worse situations than when they started. Nobody's asking questions anymore. Let me ask you a question. Why? Why don't you shut up? A classic Cartman example is the episode Casa Bonita, where Cartman goes to terrible lengths to get invited to Kyle's birthday, a night out at his favorite restaurant, Casa Bonita. It's like the Disneyland of Mexican restaurants. Casa Bonita, Casa Bonita, food and fun and a festive atmosphere. Casa At first, Cartman isn't invited to Kyle's birthday because Butters is, making their group already full. If Butters cancels, though, Cartman can join, and thus Cartman's evil scheming begins. He kidnaps Butters, locks him up in a bomb shelter, convincing him that the world is about to end, then loses him when Butters gets free. Meanwhile, lying his way into getting invited to Kyle's birthday as he's the replacement for Butters, who currently is missing and no one can find. So then, if Cartman is doing such manipulative and cruel things here, why is it so damn funny? Why do we love it? It's because, as per usual, by the end, everything blows up in Cartman's face. The other boys and the police find out about everything, and Cartman running through the restaurant getting a crappy, panicked, sped-up minute of the Casa Bonita experience with the cops in hot pursuit behind him. After he ends up caught by the police, they ask, Well, kid, you made an entire town panic, you lost all your friends, and now you're going to juvenile hall for a week. <laughs> Was it worth it? Totally. Of course it was all worth it for Cartman. As long as he got some kind of version of what he wanted, no matter how small or crummy, he's quote, won, and he's happy. But he so obviously hasn't won. All his friends hate him, and he's getting arrested and being sent to juvenile hall. But he's so delusional and stupid that he got to spend one minute in Casa Bonita that he's happy and doesn't regret a thing. All of this is what makes us love the little creep. He went through all these terrible acts and deception, everything blew up in his face, he's never truly rewarded for anything, and as usual, the story ends with Cartman being his own worst enemy. None of this would have happened if he just wasn't a little asshole. But it's all so absurd and he gets exactly what he deserves in the end that it's hilarious and enjoyable for us to watch. We can't help but love Eric Cartman. Who said I'm inviting you? This one's easy, and you can probably guess what counterbalances this character's meanness before I even get to it. Plankton from SpongeBob SquarePants is a malicious, conniving megalomaniac. Obsessed with power, he'd be happy if he could steal Mr. Krabs' secret formula for the Krabby Patty so his own fast food restaurant could be a success. But he'd be really happy if he could conquer the world. But what's there to juxtapose what a diabolical bastard he is? He's tiny! Throughout all his schemes and evil doing, barely anyone else in the show even notices him, and most of the time he's just getting stepped on like a bug. Plankton's shtick of being this giant ball of fury packed into a tiny little guy echoes bad guys of animation past like Yosemite Sam or The Brain from Pinky and the Brain. If these characters were at all large or even just average sized, they'd be a genuine threat. But they're so diminutive you can't help but look at them as a joke. Ow! 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 Ooh, I think I stepped in something.
Mr. Burns is as evil a character as you can get. He borders on supervillain, whether it be forcing his low-paid employees to work dangerous conditions, or up to even blocking out the sun so everyone has to rely on his Burns brand electricity 24 hours a day, Mr. Burns is one evil guy. But what's another clever way that the writers balance him out? While evil, he's also 104 years old, leaving him physically weak. So weak that he becomes a source of comedy, as you can't even crush a paper cup. <laughs> And not just weak, but due to his age, he's extremely forgetful, and most of the time, the entire reason he was against anyone escapes his mind and he can't remember. Simpson, eh? New man? <laughs> Actually, sir, he thwarted your campaign for governor, you ran over his son, he saved the plant from meltdown, his wife painted you in the nude. Yeah. Doesn't ring a bell. Anyone else would have fired Homer Simpson years ago, but the real threat of Mr. Burns being such a powerful man is also balanced with him both being a weakling and also extremely forgetful due to his half-senility. Homer Simpson, sir. One of your organ banks from Sector 7G. All the recent events of your life have revolved around him in some way. Simpson, eh? I think you get the point by now. These fun little additions and extra layers to these typically mean characters are what make them so entertaining to watch, and what make us come back for more. If any of these characters lost these counterbalances and were just straight up mean and nasty, they wouldn't be as fun. So if you're trying to create and write your own malicious characters, whether you add that they're also pathetic, wimpy, small in stature, physically weak, so dumb that they're their own worst enemy, or a plethora of other things, adding these little personality traits to the archetype of the mean character will juxtapose against their meanness and make them more relatable, likable, and fun for us to watch. Rather than someone just being a total asshole and that's all there is to them. We have total assholes in real life. Mean people with ugly hearts and that's it. And that's no fun. Let me know in the comments what mean characters in fiction are some of your favorites, and who you think are constructed well by their writers and creators. I have a lot more ideas for video essays like this that dive deep into creating characters, animation TV and film theories, and even topics and stories from my career in the animation industry. And they can all start popping up here on my channel in between the wait for episodes of my animated series All In Scoops. So if you like this route my channel could go, let me know. Please subscribe here to Nico Animation for original cartoons and upcoming videos like this one, and thanks so much for watching.